Clean water, clean air. We all want it, but how do we get there from here? That's this week on Motoring 2004. SN's Motoring 2004 is brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oil, oils fine-tuned for different engines, and Midas, Total Car Care, we do that. San Francisco Bay, it doesn't get any more beautiful than this, and that's exactly how Californians want to keep it. And you know, speaking of Californians, they like to pride themselves in being leaders or forerunners when it comes to things like music, fashion, food, and of course, the environment. And you know, way back in 1970, California introduced the Clean Air Act to help reduce or eliminate air pollution. And of course, vehicle emissions were at the top of the most wanted list. Well, you know, today, California produces 7% of the world's greenhouse gases with only one quarter of 1% of the world's population. Nothing to brag about. So it seems only fitting that San Francisco and Sonoma, California are hosting one of the largest global events for advanced technology vehicles. It was established back in 1998 by Michelin and it's called the Bedendum Challenge. And as we're about to see, it's not only a peek at the future of the automobile, but also a look at the future of the planet we live on. <laughs> It's becoming a very large event and maybe the event in the world, the unique event which is gathering uh, so many uh, people about clean cars. Uh, for example, we have 18 uh, hydrogen powered cars, which has never happened before. Well, this is a fantastic event. Uh, it's a rare opportunity to get all the technologies that are currently hot in alternate fuels and fuel efficiency together in the same place and basically to assemble all that brain power. Uh, the research teams, the engineering teams, the people that, that turn it from theory into nuts and bolts in the same place at the same time and to hang it out here on a test track where journalists like us can go and, and really get our hands on the metal. We have 750 million vehicles in the world at this point and as we look at the next couple of decades, uh, we'll double that and put in maybe 30, 40 years out, triple that number of vehicles. Uh, so we've got a, a huge pressure uh, with respect to the ability of the world to supply conventional petroleum, which our transportation depends on right now. So uh, we have to find ways to do something different and to get off the track that we're on right now. I've driven three of the fuel cell cars that are here. And the thing that I find absolutely remarkable, and it blows me away, is that when you're behind the wheel, the difference in driving it versus driving a regular car there isn't a whole pile. Certainly it's much quieter, there's only water dripping out of the tailpipe, but from the driving experience, they've got lots of pickup, lots of low end power. You're now beginning to see the range that uh, is demanded. You know, I mean, the early fuel cell vehicles, after you'd gone round the block, it was time to go fill up again. Nowadays, you're getting four, five, six, eight hundred kilometers out of a tank. We're looking around here at a lot of different vehicles being powered by different, different kinds of, of, of energy. Um, but give me the reality, too, with, with the gasoline engine today. Well, we've seen in the last 20, 30 years uh, remarkable achievements in getting emission reductions and also of improving engine out and fuel economy. Um, but the most spectacular has been recently when we found that if you look at the fuel and the fuel properties and the influence that the fuel has on the emission control system, clean up the fuel, that the combination of the two of them really can get some remarkable reductions. In fact, the vehicles we're seeing here and people are driving them, based on a three-year study we did in our university, these vehicles in the life cycle analysis is equivalent to driving an all-battery electric vehicle. That's a rather profound statement from my perspective. Well, I think that the Prius has shown that people are willing to spend money that way. Um, I think fuel cells when you ask people, 
the dates are always a little different. Uh, they, they range from anywhere from 2010 to 2020. And then I think there needs to be some consumer incentives. The consumer has some, beyond the, the doing good for the environment, there needs to be some kind of financial incentive to buy one of these vehicles because they are a little more expensive. The other thing too is that the governments have either got to get off the pot or use it because if they don't start subsidizing these things and legislating them into everyday life then it's it's pie in the sky because as long as gasoline's two dollars American a gallon or less than a buck a litre in Canada where's the incentive to go out and spend more money so the government has to decide whether they want to bring these things in and make them a reality or whether they're just legislating things to make life difficult for the car manufacturers. Would you buy a pair of shoes without trying them on? Would you hire somebody without a job interview? Would you marry somebody without dating them first? More later on Kenzie's Corner. Now, under normal circumstances, I would not start a test drive sitting behind the wheel. But believe it or not, this magnificent dash does not belong to an upscale luxury SUV nor a fancy schmancy car. Rather, it belongs to a pickup truck. This week on Test Drive, we take a look at Ford's all-new F-150. The F-150 covers the bases when it comes to models, and so finding a knowledgeable salesperson is of paramount importance. Along with five different trim levels, there's regular, super, and the crew cab tested, a choice of three box lengths, two body styles, two engines, and either rear or four-wheel drive derivatives. My single biggest peeve with this F-150 is the fact that it only comes with a part-time four-wheel drive system. Now that means you cannot engage four-wheel drive on anything other than a slippery surface, snowy road or a muddy field. Now the reason for that is, the instant you engage four high, you lock the center differential, which causes, whenever you turn it on a full lock, what we call wind-up. Now wind-up has to be dissipated. Now in this particular instance, when I was driving in a full circle, what happened, this wheel was spinning, which allowed all of the wind-up to dissipate. If I did that on a dry road, it would damage the truck. For that reason, this thing needs a full-time four-wheel drive system. In other words, set and forget. Set it in November, leave it till March. That would prevent this truck from getting damaged by inadvertently selecting four high with the part-time system. The engine choices boil down to the base 4.6 litre V8 with 231 horsepower and 293 pounds feet of torque or the up level 5.4 litre V8 motor. Now it dishes out 300 horsepower and a stump pulling 365 pounds feet of torque at just 3750 RPM. Adding variable valve timing to the mix spreads the power over a broad range. As a result, the F-150 pulls well from just about any speed. The downside is the fuel consumption. A test average of 18.2 litres per 100 kilometres means a heavy foot is going to cost you, as in over $12 for every 100k you put on the clock. You know, I mentioned how well the F-150's been finished off inside. Full leather, very nice accents around the centre stack that houses a great radio and effective climate controls. You also get all the power features, including a power moonroof, as well as a really nice set of dials. Now, along with all the usual stuff, you also get battery voltage and oil pressure dials. But the coup de grace is probably the most overlooked safety item in the modern car, and that's power adjustable pedals. Quite simply, get in, set the seat relative to the steering wheel. Now I've got the correct driving position. Power the pedals back to suit my shorter legs, and Bob's your uncle. If the airbag does deploy, I ain't gonna bite it. The core structure is also new, meaning a fully boxed frame that is an incredible nine times stiffer torsionally than the outgoing model. This increased strength really does show up when the body is torqued. Rather than watching the cabin box move in different directions, the lot now moves as a single unit. Consequently, there are fewer moans and groans. 
The new frame is also longer, which adds a much needed 6 inch stretch to the super cab and an additional 13 inches of storage space behind the front seat of the regular cab. You know, the business end of this pickup truck has been well thought through. This bed extender increases the effective length of the bed very effectively. And there's an assist in the tailgate so you don't have to be built like Arnold Schwarzenegger to shut it. You can also lock it in the closed position, which prevents people from pinching it. Now, the last time I tested an F-150, I complained that the spare tire was not the same size as the rest. This time it is. However, there's still another pet peeve. It comes with a pressed steel rim. If I'm paying $51,000 for a pickup truck, I want one the same as the rest. The other thing they've done is they've increased the depth of the box by some two inches. Now, whilst that's great for capacity, unless you happen to be an NBA player, well, the only way to get anything out of it is to get into it. Stopping power comes from disc brakes all round and a decent anti-lock system. The stops are straight, controlled and remarkably short considering the 5,200 pound heft they must bring to a halt. Elsewhere, the F-150 counts smart front airbags. These look at impact severity, seatbelt usage and the passenger's weight to determine the best deployment strategy. You know, this new F-150 has to be the most important new vehicle launch in Ford's history. And for the most part, with the exception of that 4x4 system, well, they've got it right. Magnificent interior, it's comfortable, and with a 9,500 pound tow capacity, it is capable. In short, those plastic seated rubber matted monsters of old, well, they're gone for good. Our Midas tip of the week concerns your vehicle's battery. Some battery problems are very obvious. If the vehicle has a no start, needs to be boosted or towed in, or you need a service call to get it going, that's pretty obvious that you may need a new battery. But some battery problems aren't so obvious. With maintenance-free batteries, if they're a few years old or your vehicle hasn't had a new battery in quite some time, here's a problem that you can have that you definitely don't want to run into. For example, let's say you run out of gas or break down and your vehicle has to sit somewhere on the side of the road with the four ways on or the parking lights on. If your battery doesn't have reserve capacity, the battery could die, it won't drive those lights and another vehicle piles into it. You definitely don't want that. So you want to check your vehicle for reserve capacity. Simple way to do that, turn on your parking lights for 30 to 40 minutes and then try and start the vehicle. If the battery still got reserve capacity, it'll start like the lights were never on. If it labors or won't start at all, you probably need a new battery. But better still, bring your vehicle into a Midas shop and get the guys to run a performance test on it. That way you're not stuck somewhere with your seat of the pants test and you still need a new battery or a boost and maybe you don't have the right hardware. So bring it in, have the battery tested and replaced if it shows any defects. That's your Midas tip of the week. The high wire is the symbol of the future of technology for General Motors and we think for the industry as well. It represents the confluence of two significant technologies. One is fuel cell technology and the other one is bi-wire technology. And bi-wire technology is the way you fly airplanes today. You know, the pilot doesn't really do anything mechanically when he or she is flying the airplane. It just provides an electrical signal and that, that activates the electronics to make something happen. Similarly in the high wire, so you have no mechanical connections, everything's done electronically. The thing that's unique about the power system is that the fuel cell, all the hydrogen storage tanks and all the power electronics are basically contained in a flat floorboard of the vehicle. So that gives you a tremendous freedom of design for the vehicle. The fuel cell basically is a what you would call a chemical battery. The thing that's different about this battery compared to the normal battery in your car is there's actually a fuel going into it to keep it uh, active, to keep it charged, and that fuel is hydrogen. When you combine hydrogen with oxygen, you get a reaction that creates electricity. The end goal, first of all, is to uh, solve the energy and the environmental issues that we face today, and, 
And what we hope to, hope to learn from the high wire is to get experience with packaging these systems together in a realistic uh, way and also to get uh, customer feedback from having the opportunity to experience the driving and, and use of fuel cells. You know, along with the famous cable cars, the city of San Francisco is into clean air. In fact, the city requires all purchases of fleet vehicles to be nothing but clean fuel vehicles. In fact, they've got close to 400 vehicles powered by natural gas on the road today. But you know, we all can't afford this new technology. So what do we do to keep the emissions down in our own cars and trucks? Well, let's put that question to our man in the Quaker State Garage, Bill Gardner. Brad, there's all kinds of things you can do. First of all, tune-ups. Now, if your vehicle's really new, it may not require tune-ups until 160,000 kilometer intervals. But if, if it doesn't have platinum tip spark plugs and or it's a few years old, those intervals could be as short as 50,000 kilometers. So check and find out when your vehicle last had a tune-up and what the intervals are required for that particular vehicle. Use quality name brand parts when you do it. Also, make sure that the air filter is changed on a regular basis. Once again, quality name brand products. Another important item, keep the fuel injectors clean. If the vehicle's got high miles, you can take it in and have them professionally cleaned at a mechanic shop or an oil change uh, fast lube shop. They can do it for you. And also you can use additives through the tank that will keep the fuel system clean once you've had it professionally cleaned. They also do, do a lot towards removing carbon from the engine and carbon deposits can cause high emissions and rob you of power and fuel economy. So check that out as well. Another important thing to do is regular oil changes. Some people don't realize how much of, how important a factor that can be because if you neglect to change the oil and or top it up and you get some wear taking place in the engine, eventually that engine will start consuming oil and the oil consumption itself causes an emission. Eventually if it gets bad enough you'll see blue smoke in the exhaust, but many cars burn significant quantities of oil without ever seeing any blue smoke in the exhaust. And that oil that's consumed in the engine will slowly poison the oxygen sensors in the engine and the catalytic converter in the exhaust system, which are two of your most important components in the complex emission system package on today's vehicles. Once those two components go down or get ineffective, your emissions go way up and your fuel economy goes way down. So make sure you change the oil on a regular basis with quality products like Quaker State. You'll, you'll have a, you can then have a high mileage engine that never uses any oil because you didn't wear out the engine. Another thing that's very important is your driving habits. I see people on my street that accelerate hard to go down to a stop sign that's 300 feet away. When they come back I hear them hard on the throttle again, hard on the brakes, and I, I actually see one fellow that hits the throttle really hard just in the length of his driveway and then slams on the brakes again at the garage door. If he was just a little bit smoother on his driving habits, he'd save a lot of fuel and he'd save emissions too because every time you go down hard on the throttle and then lift off and hit the brakes, that's just hard on your vehicle and hard on the emission control system as well. So smooth out your driving habits. Also look at how, what types of vehicles you buy. You know, I love driving my pickup truck, but today I've got lots of gear in the back. I've got a reason to drive it, but if I were going on a two or three hundred mile trip and all I had was an overnight bag and a cooler, I'd have to think about taking one of the cars in the driveway that gets twice the fuel mileage of the pickup truck. Another thing, Brad, and this has always been my pet peeve, a big waster of fuel and terrible for emissions is a remote car starter. If you've got one, stop using it. If you're thinking of buying one, don't. And if you're thinking of giving somebody one as a gift, do them a favor and don't because this morning, a little bit of frost on the windshield. I look out, there's a car starting three driveways down, nobody in the car. I know they were pressing the remote starter button, and in the 15 minutes it took me to load all this gear in the back of the pickup, the vehicle sat there idling the whole time. Total waste. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 2004. Now back before most of you were born, I was actually a BMW dealer. We lasted maybe six weeks, never actually opened our doors. Probably just as well we would have lasted minutes, maybe hours before we went bankrupt. But we did have one good idea. Our plan was to take cars to the homes and offices of prospective customers, give them a chance to really try the vehicle. 
Of course, we went out of business before we even started. Now, a bunch of years later, Saab in Canada actually implemented that program, and they found it was very successful, a high conversion rate test drive to actual purchase. Then Saab got bought by General Motors, and the whole thing was canned. Well now, ironically enough, it's General Motors who's brought back the 24-hour test drive. That's right, you go to your GM dealer, you probably have to pledge your firstborn child to your right arm as collateral, and you get to drive the car of your choice for an entire day. Now it's stunning when you think that a huge percentage of cars, maybe even the majority of new cars, are purchased without a test drive. In many cases, people never even sit in the car. I mean, if you're, you get a company car, the fleet manager sends around a sheet of paper and you check off, um, let's see, gray Taurus or green Intrepid or blue Impala, and that's it. Even at the retail level, even high-end cars, people will often buy them only having sat in them, never driven them, maybe just around the block. That's crazy. You're making a three to four year commitment here. So now General Motors has given you a chance to really try the vehicle out. To me, that shows that they've got true confidence in their vehicles. From their perspective, it's the old show business adage, it's a chance to get bums in seats. So my question is, Ford, Chrysler, Toyota, Honda, are you ready to step up? I'm Jim Kenzie. Over 300 automotive journalists attended this year's edition of the Michelin Bibendum Challenge in San Francisco and Sonoma, California. And they got to hear about and drive some pretty incredible vehicles aimed at cleaning up the air that we breathe. And incidentally, we'll have a look at more of those vehicles on future programs. But you know, we also heard some cold realities. For instance, in China, over 2,000 new vehicles are registered every hour. It's also predicted that by the year 2020, we will have over a billion vehicles on this planet. That's an increase of 40%. And finally, 95% of all our transportation needs is still supplied by one source, and that is oil. So we've got a long way to go, but at least we're headed in the right direction. That's it for now. We'll see you next time out as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. X-Drive is for the idiot driver in every family. It'd be hard to get into a situation that this car could not get you out of. TSN's Motoring 2004 has been brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oil, oils fine-tuned for different engines, and Midas, Total Car Care. We do that.